everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week we're going to talk about rifle to pistol transition. Now, transitions is something I teach in my rifle classes. Uh, defensive rifle one or patrol rifle run is when we first really start getting into transition. And the reason for that is they're less likely. Um, they're more likely if you work in an occupation where you carry a rifle and a handgun. They're less likely if you work in an occupation where by occupation you don't carry either. Um, our everyday citizens, our armed guys, you're probably, your default protection is probably the handgun. So it's probably more likely for you to just have a handgun than it is for you to have a rifle and handgun. But because it can happen, it's something we definitely need to address. But hopefully, you've taken the time to build the skill sets independently before you combine them. So, working under the assumption that you've done that, and we're at that point, what is the impetus for a transition? Why would I transition from a rifle to a handgun? Well, it's pretty simple. Either the rifle runs out of ammunition, or the rifle experiences a malfunction. Now, the second one and the first one can be dependent on the situation and the distance to our threat, if any. The third reason we might transition from a rifle to a handgun is that we get into such close quarters that the rifle is not an effective weapon system. It cannot be effectively maneuvered. Those environments are few and far between, but they do exist. So, if I'm going to transition, either I've ran out of ammunition, I've experienced a malfunction, or I'm getting into a really, really tight, tight environment. Um, how do I do it? Well. We'll get into that, but first I want to talk about bright line distances. Uh, when I first went through uh, my first patrol rifle instructor course, I learned that 15 meters in, in in is when we transition to the handgun. It was given as a default. This is this is the only time you do it. Any further back than that, don't even bother, because you'll have cover available to you, or you'll be far enough away that you have time to fix your malfunction, or blah 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 blah. Um, now, I'm, I like to think pretty realistically, pretty common sense. I realize that threats are more likely to be closer than they are further away. However, the fact further away threats do exist, so it's something we need to be prepared for, which is why when I focus just on handgun skills, I don't only shoot at 3, 5, 7, 10, 15 meters. I work it all the way back. The transition is entire transition distance is entirely dependent on your skill set or the condition of the rifle. So, if I have a threat who's 15.5 meters away, and I have no way how I would accurately judge that without a rangefinder, uh, but let's say he looks like he's 20 meters away. Bang, 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 rifle goes dead. I'm like, oh, I can't transition, so let me fix it. Knowing full well that I have a skill set to get really good hits with my handgun. So I'm out of the fight until I perform my reload, or worse, out of the fight until I fix my malfunction. Now, some malfunctions can be cleared just as fast as you can reload the rifle, but the point is, is I have a perfectly good weapon system right here, or usually, for me, right here. So, what's the distance for the transition? It's your personal decision. I'm not going to give you a bright line distance because bright line distances do not exist in self-defense settings. When are you going to find yourself in a situation where you're carrying the rifle and the handgun? Occupationally dependent, lifestyle dependent. Uh, I can't say that either. But what I will say is if, if it happens and it's close, probably a good idea to go to the handgun. The further you are away, probably the more options you have to avoid a transition altogether. But since the pistol is available and the rifle is down when we're doing our where a transition might be on the menu, you might want to think about, instead of trying to set this bright line distance, think about, okay, what's my skill set on the handgun? Can I get acceptable hits? Now, granted, the handgun is not as effective, terminally ballistically speaking, as the rifle is. But if the rifle's immediately down and there's an active engagement going on, maybe the pistol is going to get me to a position where I can get my rifle back up. So I won't bright line distance, and I won't say if A, do B. I'll just say that transitions are something that you should be practicing if you own both weapon systems. All right, obviously for you right-handed shooters, uh, you probably already have a pretty good technique. The most important thing about the transition, be it right-handed or left-handed, is to get the rifle clear of the draw stroke of the pistol. Uh, that is usually done by guiding the rifle 
out of the way with the support hand until it's secure. Purchasing, releasing any kind of mechanism you have for tension to draw the gun. Begin your draw stroke, release the rifle, hands meet, pistols up, shoot if you need to. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, right, right, left, left, the biggest issue you have is your control hand on the rifle is going to be your control hand on the pistol. So when you're getting into this and you're getting new to it, a lot of people are rushing to get that handgun out. Your transition needs to be fast, but it needs to be efficient. And once it's super efficient, speed will come. Uh, I see a lot of guys who get caught up in the sling or they get caught up in the method or when they get to the holster, they're going so fast for that retention device, if they're using a retention device and even holsters that don't have them, seeing guys start to drag the holster up trying to get the gun out of it. And then they stop and stare at it and then they think about the problem and then they're actually able to get the handgun out and get the handgun to work. Practicing your transition, super important. What's more important, right, right or left, left, but we're talking about right, right, right now, is getting the rifle back up once the handgun is not immediately needed. So if I've had to transition, I got my handgun out, and it's time to bring the rifle back up. Support hand first, handgun away, reload, fix malfunction, whatever the problem is, get the rifle back up. Uh, priority of work. If I bring my handgun out and I burn however many rounds, if I'm fairly certain I burned most of my magazine, would it be smart to reload the handgun before going back to the rifle? Absolutely. Because um, you may need that handgun again. But then let's think about the situation. Why did we transition? What's the situation? What's the environment? Can I get to cover? Can I get to some kind of cover and perform all these things in probably a safer position? I always want to be seeking that position of advantage. On the range, we don't often work that as much because ranges usually don't give us a realistic setting in which to practice our skills. So. My priority of work is the rifle. Unless I'm absolutely certain that I burned the majority of that handgun magazine, I'm not going to default reload the handgun. I'm going to default holster the handgun and reload the rifle. At that point, once I'm secure and I don't need the rifle in immediate need, then I can bring out, perform my reload, or pop on the holster, however I want to do it. Um, there is no one way. I will not say default reload the handgun before you holster it, and I won't say default reload the rifle first. Whatever the situation is, is going to kind of warrant what technique or what takes priority when it comes to getting either weapon system back up. Now, as a left-handed shooter, life can be a little bit more difficult when it comes to the transition insofar as the rifle is concerned. Everything else is going to remain the same, and if you're left-handed, you've already been dealing with this. So if you already have a method, if your method is already smooth and precise and you've rounded the edges and you've worked out all the inefficiencies, then by all means, keep doing what you're doing. But if you're new to it, or if you're looking for maybe a different technique to try to see if it's going to improve your efficiency and your speed, this is the way I generally handle left-handed transitions. Now, the rifle is set up for right-handed shooters for the most part. So our safety selector is on the outside. Now me, when the safety's on, I ride my thumb over here. Not necessarily on the safety unless I'm ready to go, but it's in that general area just like my trigger is off the trigger, or my finger is off the trigger. It's ready to go in there and, and get on the trigger and do work if I need to, but the thumb basically occupies the same kind of space. If the safety needs to come off and I come up on the gun, I sweep the safety as I'm coming up and put the thumb right back on the other side of the gun with the traditional grip. Finger goes to the uh, trigger when it needs to go to the trigger and I shoot if I need to shoot. Uh, not really any loss of speed or motion from a right-handed shooter sweeping with their thumb when it's on the, the correct side or the left side of the gun. Uh, a lot of left shooters have a tendency to think they need ambidextrous controls Ambidextrous controls are great, but they do have some significant drawbacks, which I'm going to address later in the video. So for me, I tend to keep my rifle set up, even my guns that I shoot left-handed a lot, as the traditional right-handed model. Uh, as far as the other controls go, you guys have probably already experienced, you know, how to strip a mag, how to use your thumb, and then when it comes to hitting the release, nothing different. You can either come, on, come in, in here, or if you've got an ambi release or whatever, uh, I have seen some shooters, especially under stress, they'll default to a primary hand slap and then come back. I don't like that. However, if it's fast and efficient for you, keep doing it until you find a way to do it more efficiently. That's not something I would stick with just because you're releasing this control for really not much gain, uh, if any gain at all. Now, as far as the transition goes, it's the same as for right-handed shooters. I'm going to be up, I'm going to be on the gun, bang, 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 however many rounds go. Whatever happens to the gun that forces me to transition, if I make the decision to transition, I just guide the gun out of the way, purchase the pistol, release the rifle, get the pistol in the fight. Now, when it comes time 
to bring the rifle back into the fight or index or whatever you're doing. Try not to treat it as an administrative thing, even if it is an administrative thing. Get used to the idea that you might need to get that rifle up quickly. I'm going to repurchase my support hand grip while I'm still on the pistol. Now obviously, if there's still shooting to be done, I'm probably not going to do this. If I found cover or maybe my threat's down or maybe my threat went to cover, that may be something different. But if it's time to get the rifle back up, I'm going to get that support hand grip and I'm going to bring the rifle up. At that point, I will holster the gun release the magazine, perform my reload, or fix my malfunction, get the rifle back up. Now, if you're lucky enough to be cross-dominant, the world is pretty much your oyster when it comes to transitions. Your transitions are going to be marginally faster than your left-left or your right-right-handed friends. Uh, there are some distinct advantages to training yourself to be cross-dominant, but it requires such a probably immense investment, depending on how naturally ambidextrous you are, that it might not be worth it for every single person. It all depends on what your occupation is and what you expect to get out of your training, and you may perish some skills while trying to improve others. As far as cross-dominant goes, it's either going to be right-left or left-right. Either way is going to be an advantage. With the rifle up, if I run out of ammunition and I'm close enough that I feel like I need to transition or I experience a malfunction or whatever reasons cause me a malfunction, I still have control of the rifle as I come down, bring the pistol out, use the pistol if the pistol needs to be needed, used, and then, when it's time to get my rifle back up, I can still maintain muzzle, and this is the advantage, I can still maintain muzzle control of my threat until my rifle is back up and ready to be reloaded or repaired. Now, and I would mentioned that I don't like ambidextrous controls, and here's why. Um, my safety is on the inside of my rifle uh, as a right-handed rifle shooter. So when my rifle hangs, the safety is against my body. Now, not a huge deal um, for most people. That's where their safety is going to be. But I don't want my safety against my body. Why? Well, if I have to go hands-on for any reason, or if my hands are just off my rifle, I'm not even talking about transition necessarily, it's just I'm doing something. Or maybe I'm slinging my rifle to the back or whatever. If I'm doing something with my hands, I'm not maintaining proper control of my rifle, it's unsafe. But it can brush against gear, and the safety can come off. And then, you know, if the stars align perfectly, I could have a negligent discharge. So me personally, if I'm going to go hands-off in any non-emergency situation, I roll my rifle outboard. The reason I do that is it puts the safety on the outside and there's nothing on the inside that can brush against my body to cause the safety to come off. If I had an ambidextrous safety, I would not have this option. So left, left, right, right, if you're running the safety on one side or the other, if you're left-handed, I suggest you run the safety on you know the right side of the rifle. If you're right-handed, run it on the left side of the rifle and just leave it alone. And this will prevent any kind of issue like this. Now, ambidextrous safeties are great because they exist. But I gotta be honest, I don't use them a whole lot. And when I say a whole lot, I mean pre pretty much not at all unless it's in a precision rifle type setting on this platform. And even then, I can get away with not using them at all. So, the ambidextrous safety is cool, but you have to ask yourself and be honest, is it really necessary? Now I'm not saying go take it off your gun, but really vet the gear before you trust your life and trust, the, you know, trust your chances to having an ND or not uh, when it comes to your equipment. It's much safer when you're hands off to be able to take the safety off of any potential surface where it can come off safe when you don't want it to. Now, this video is not about malfunctions, either on the rifle or the handgun. But let's say the reason for my transition was my rifle went down. So, rifle goes out of the way, handgun comes out, handgun does work or not, whatever. Time to put the handgun away, get the rifle back up. So I go for my sport hand purchase, but I know that it was a malfunction. So as I bring the rifle up, I might glance, and this is just you know something you might want to check out and see if you like it, to see the condition of the rifle. And then I can decide what I'm going to do. I may be like, all right, that's a double feed, or that looks like a bolt over. I'm going to go ahead and leave the rifle, stay with the handgun until I can find cover, and then I'm going to get the rifle back up. That is just an option. Um, I'm sure that might be something weird to you. Maybe you've never heard of it before, but you know what? I have eyes, and I can bring the rifle into my peripheral vision and be like, you know what? I can't fix that right now because I'm still dealing with this threat. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that, stay with my handgun. Um, all dependent on the type of malfunction. I'm not saying do that as a default. If it was a failure to fire, if you just had a dead trigger, you look at the rifle, the bolt's closed, holster up, tap, rack, reassess. If you look and there's like, like a bouquet of brass sticking out of the ejection port, that might take a little bit more time to fix. So maybe stay with the gun you know is working and you know will continue to work because you don't know how long that's going to take to fix, especially if it's an atypical malfunction that you've never seen before. Like, what is this? I have no idea how that did that. Everyone, at some point, will experience a malfunction like that. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and every now and then I look at, I look at a gun and I'm like, how in the fuck did that happen? 
So, I prefer the option of this, because it's like, hey, let me look, okay, yeah, I can't fix that right now. Or it's like, well, I knew it was a dead trigger, and upon looking at this, okay, it's probably just, you know, failure to fire, I'm going to rack that brass clean, get my rifle back in the fight. Um, again, not saying this is a default methodology that you should take up, but it's just some advice, just something that I like to do, uh, because it does make my life a little easier when it comes to maintaining, a f I guess, efficiency of my weapon systems. And I know I've talked about it in videos before, but I'm going to address it again. I use two-point slings. Uh, the reason for that is when I, you know, when it's time to transition, I don't have to worry about the rifle hitting me in the dick, or I don't have to worry about a hot barrel or a hot suppressor on a single-point sling burning me. Um, single point slings are convenient but i don't like them because they're only convenient when your hands are on the gun once it's time to let go of a rifle either you've got a duck walk or you've got to take it like a man as i've been told and let the rifle smash you in the knees and shins or let hot suppressors burn your legs things like that so and i've used single point slings it's not like i haven't used them um, i did use them for a couple of years when i was a contractor they were great because they were really fast in and out of vehicles um, but that really, to me, was their only real advantage. Um, two points are awesome. Um, and I've talked about this. In fact, I did a video specifically on sling management. I run my sling all the way out. So even if I do transition and I drop my rifle, it's in a position where I'm not really going to have to worry about it moving about because I've got two points of control on the rifle versus one point of control on the rifle creating a pendulum. Uh, I don't want my rifle to become a very heavy, very potentially hot pendulum smacking me about my body. So. Two-point slings, even when you run them all the way out, are, to me, much more effective, especially speaking about transitions, uh, than a one-point sling. And as a final word, if you own a rifle and you own a pistol, uh, be realistic about it. Um, what I mean by that is, is, is be honest with yourself when you practice the skill. Uh, I see people's accuracy suffer when they're working transition drills because they're more worried about the smoothness of the technique than they are about the accuracy on target or on threat. Um, and you never want to see a skill set suffer because you're trying to accomplish something else. Now, certain situations or conditions or environments or distances can affect accuracy, but the transition generally occurs at a closer distance, so there's really no excuse for your accuracy to go from this to this, uh, or to from this to what, well, I don't know where any of those went. <sighs> Slow it down, build up that efficiency, and then work your way towards speed. If you're already fast on the rifle and you're already fast on the handgun, don't assume just getting into transition techniques that you're still going to maintain that speed and accuracy when you start working the two weapon systems together i like striker fired handguns there's really not a striker fired rifle so to speak what i mean by that is the glock has you know an active trigger safety but it doesn't have a manual safety that i have to disengage the rifle does not a huge deal right well you get your heart rate up a little bit as a symptom of stress not a cause uh, and you, you started mixing things up and you might forget which weapon system has what kind of control and you may laugh But it does happen. I see it happen to students and I experienced it myself many many years ago repeatedly when I got into situations like During like force on force exchanges or just have an instructor right in my ear um, My skill set was still building so I was at that point where I was very susceptible to range failures. Uh, and I worked through it, and now I got to the point where I don't make that mistake anymore. But just getting into it is definitely something that can happen. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of ammo, obviously. Um, I generally, you know, I'll take a 20-round box, and I'll grab a couple magazines, and I'll put three in one, four in another, five in another, six in another, and I'll mix them all up. So I don't know exactly when that transition is going to happen. The handgun, you know, I'll fill the magazines all the way up just so I get a lot of good handgun time in. And handgun ammunition is usually cheaper than rifle ammunition, depending on what you shoot. Uh, so that's good. Um, but I had repeated requests for this video, and it's something even students have asked me to put out. Uh, so I decided to, you know, go ahead and dress it the way I dress it, because I've had people tell me I teach transitions a little bit differently. So I you know, kind of wanted to give you guys a look at it. Um, if you have any comments, complaints, concerns, questions, just go ahead and drop them uh, in the comment box below. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Transition accordingly. Yeah, cross-dominant master race. Should I say that? I might offend somebody, cross-dominant. Yeah, never mind. Let's do it.